Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. Today's video is about lawnmowers. And I've got a lot to say about lawnmowers because why not? If you're not familiar with my videos and this is the first one you've ever seen, I do tend to yammer a lot in my videos. I talk about a lot of different things and we jump from subject to subject, point to point. There is no linear order to anything that spews forth from my mouth. So I want to make sure that you all know that this is going to be a long video. Because, why not? And just uh, to let you all know, this video does contain foul language, so if that sort of thing offends you, just don't watch the video. You can stop right now. Um, there are plenty of other videos on my channel that are clean and safe for work. This one may not be one of them, so just wanted to let you know ahead of time. When I was a kid, I'm 35. For reference, I'm 35. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in the 90s, I had a little lawn mowing business. Not a very successful one, because I was a crappy businessman. Really though, thinking back, I think I had a lawn mowing business for the sole reason that I just loved tinkering with small engines. I had weed whackers, I had lawn mower, I had about two lawn mowers at one point. And I only had a few customers in the mobile home park that I lived in. I charged five bucks a lawn. In 1995, 96, 97, that was a fucking deal. Um, today, you, you can't even mow your own lawn for five dollars. Anyway, um, so my very first mower was a Suffolk, Suffolk um, push reel mower. Now, the lady that I got the mower from, see, this is how bad of a businessman I was. So. She said, hey, little boy, would you like to mow my lawn? No, she, she, really, she really didn't sound like that. She was a nice old lady, lived right next door to us. She passed away recently. It's about 10 years ago she passed away. Anyway, long story short, I said, well, yeah. I mean, I, I, was, what, how was I? I was like 10 years old, I think. I think I was 10. I was 9 or 10 years old at the time. I think I was 9. And I didn't have a job, obviously. I'm fucking 9. Uh, so... I said, you know what? Yeah, I'd love to do that. And I, and I needed money, as all nine-year-olds do. So she was a shrewd woman. Shrewd as shrewd can be. Her name was Diane. That's a shrewd woman name. And God, you know, I loved her. She, she, was, she, was, she was just a... It was a funny thing. We, you know, she, she was just a great woman. She used to bring me and my sister to the beach and... You know, but she had her mean side, and her mean side was taking advantage of little boys. Well, that didn't sound right. No, what, what I'm saying is she, <laughs> she would pay me a dollar to mow her lawn. Now, the lawn wasn't that big. I mean, in, in hindsight, it was probably about, in hindsight, in re, probably about a tenth of an acre, maybe. It was a mobile home park, but it was a nice park. It, was, it wasn't like a bunch of tin cans stacked in... You know, like a, like a, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like a used car lot. No, this was a nice community. And, you know, anyway, so her lawn, I mowed it for a dollar a week in the summer of 94. And the equipment, I didn't have my own mower. So she said, oh, why don't you take this mower that I got for free and uh, you can mow my lawn with this push mower. It was a push mower and it wasn't one of the good ones. It was a... It was a real, you know, like the real, you know, that kind of thing. Antique type, but it wasn't an antique. This thing was made in the 70s. It was light as shit. So when you pushed it, it didn't have any momentum, you know. And I, and I spent hours tinkering with the blade adjustment, getting it just right. The one thing you couldn't do with a push mower was mow down weeds. No, no, those things do not touch weeds. Forget it. Not going to happen. So anyway. <laughs> Her lawn was all weeds, by the way. So I'm pushing, you know, I, I, I'm mowing with this fucking thing. And my dad, he felt bad for me. He's like, look, look, you know what? You're working your ass off for this woman. You need a mower. So um, he actually gave me or lent me our family mower, <laughs> the mower that my dad would use on our lawn. And then it became my job to mow not only her lawn, but my family's lawn. The deal was, as long as I mowed our lawn first, my dad would pay for the gas. He was a great guy. Still is. Um, so, 
I got to use our Electric Start Craftsman rotary mower. Kind of like this guy here. Didn't have a bag though. It was uh, just a Craftsman um, Eager Beaver. Uh, Eager, Eager Beaver. It was the Eager One. That's what they called the Eager One with a Tecumseh. Was it four? I think it was a three and a half or a, it was a four horse. It was a nice one. It had self propulsion. It was a nice mower um, for, for that. You know, I think it was made in 89 or so. It wasn't that old. It was like five years old. But it leaked like a sieve. It leaked oil every time you went to go push the handle down to, to start another strip. Oil would just come gushing out, so I had to keep refilling the crankcase. Anyway, so a year of doing that. Oh, and I had to raise my. My dad said you you can use the power mower, but you got to raise your prices to five dollars per week. So it was a steady income for a little nine-year-old, ten-year-old kid. So. On my 11th birthday, my parents bestowed upon my, um, upon my, upon me, a brand new, brand new, fresh. It was in the box, 1995, fire engine red, Murray 20 inch lawnmower, and I was happier than a pig in shit. My parents bought me a lawnmower, and not because they just did it. I had asked, I'm like, what, you know, they asked me, what do you want for your birthday? And it was, you know, my birthday's in May, so it was, get the hell out of my bag. Get that, get, 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 get it. So, we'll get to that in a minute. And this, don't worry. This is a long video, so, so grab the popcorn. Um, so, and it's not exciting, it's just me yammering on. I'm, you know, a middle-aged male homeowner. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, typical stuff. So, uh, so anyway, so for my 11th birthday, my parents got me a brand new, brand new, oh, it was so nice. It was a uh, $99 Walmart special. It was the Murray with the three and a half horse Briggs. Um, this thing was so basic, it didn't even have a throttle control. The, uh, this was in the, this is uh, the, when they started using plastic uh, carburetors and Briggs um, vertical shaft engines. Um, it was the, the they, it was, that was when they were calling their run-of-the-mill L-head motor the classic engine. So it was a, uh, the throttle was, was uh, locked into one, into its highest position permanently. It had a primer ball, plastic carburetor, 20-inch um, deck, no frills, no, no mulching option. It had no bag, just a side chute. Um, no, you know, it was just a, you're, I'm talking bare bones here. But to an 11 year old kid who wants to make money so he can buy cool shit, it was the best gift I think I have ever gotten in my life. But not only, it, was, it lasted, I got 10 years out of this mower, uh, spoiler alert, but lasted 10 years and never really had a problem with it. I changed the oil once a season. Um, I would drain the fuel out at the end of every season. Uh, towards the end of its life, it did start to burn some oil, and you know the carburetor was getting a little out of adjustment. Those plastic—it was the Pulsa Prime. It was a Pulsa or VacuJet, Pulsa Prime or VacuJet carburetor. Forget which one it was. Uh, what, what they called that one. Um, but yeah, those would, as they get older, they would start to go out of uh, out of tune, and there wasn't a hell of a lot you could do to fix them. Just buy a new carburetor. Um, but I got many years out of that mower. I mowed a lot of lawns with that sucker. And as I got older, I joined up with a friend and we would we would actually, we were going door to door trying to sell lawn mowing jobs. We did not succeed. Um, nobody wants to hire a kid off the street to mow their lawn. And that was when we were raising our prices to $20. That was $10 a piece to mow an average homeowner lawn. Uh, you know, like a postage stamp, you know. Anyway, so that is, uh, you know, that was my childhood, mowing lawns. And, and you know, for, for a kid uh, in the 90s, that was a little bit unusual, a little bit, especially in the community we lived in. We lived in a fairly wealthy community where kids didn't have to work. Um, parents would buy them anything they wanted, and then they would grow up to become leeches. But that's, you know, that's, that's, the, that's, that's yeah, whatever. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> fast forward a few years. So, yeah, my, my entire childhood, though, I, I, I was obsessed with fixing lawnmower engines. And YouTube didn't exist. Um, and the only, the only reference material I had available to me was whatever the town library had, which wasn't much. So I had to learn everything on my own. 
Um, you know, my dad was an auto mechanic, so he would help me when I got stuck. He was really good at adjusting carburetors where I wasn't that great at it, but I could get them running. And um, I had a neighbor, um, John the Junk Man, who used to work for uh, one of the local town dumps. And he would come home with lawnmowers, snowblowers, rototillers. And when I was bored, I would run over to his yard and I'd grab a machine and start tinkering. And I pretty much had a very good success rate getting junkers running again. Um, never did any internal repairs, though. I never, I never really challenged myself. I never really got a machine that I felt was worth digging into. Um, one time I got a, a snapper self-propelled probably 21 or 22 inch mower it was originally owned by a landscaping company it had a honda gv150 i think uh, motor on it and um that was an older that was an older one probably early 80s late 70s early 80s um, one of the earlier honda mower mower engines and that one, when it ran, it ran like a champ, but it was very finicky. Another funny story I want to share with you guys, and this is some of you guys who watch my videos who are also into um, small engines and small engine repair, you're probably going to reach through your screens and choke me. And to this day, this decision that I made, which, you know, uh, <laughs> I just... I really, really cringe at this one thing because, well, let me explain. So, John the Junk Man, our neighbor next door, he uh, would bring home all kinds of stuff from the local dump. And one time he brought home a lawn boy, a lawn boy mower, a two-stroke lawn boy. But not, not what you're thinking, not the one you're picturing, you know, the green one, 1970s looking thing. This was a, uh, it, was a it was originally painted like a, like a gold like a brownish gold. It was a 1950s or 1960s lawn boy, two stroke um, lawn mower. Um, mint condition, absolutely mint condition. Um, it didn't run, wouldn't start. And he didn't know how to fix it. So my dad bought it from him. He, he, my dad paid him a certain, I don't know what he paid for it. But my dad's like, ooh, I'll take that. So he, because my dad loves antiques. No wonder I do. No wonder why I'm into this whole shit. Uh, so my, my dad bought it for himself. He was going to fix it and, you know, have fun with it. And it just sort of sat in our shed for like 10 years. It just sat and sat and sat. And I'm like, hey, dad, I, I want to get that old lawn boy running. Because I know you're not, you're not really... You're too busy with your stuff, and I kind of want to see it run again. So he's like, oh, yeah, go ahead. So I grabbed the mower. Now, mind you, this was before we had the Internet. This was before eBay. This is probably 95, 96. So, I mean, we didn't have the Internet back then. And you'll, you'll understand why that plays into this in a little bit. So I took this lawn boy, right? I took the carburetor apart, cleaned all the gunk out, cleaned the fuel tank, um, you know, it had great compression, really good compression. So if you can picture what this motor looks like, picture like, um, it looked like it was made to the 20s, right? So it had a um, an, an aluminum deck, very 50s design. Just Google like early lawn boy mower and you'll see what I mean. It was, it was, a, it was a small little thing, probably, probably 18, 19 inches. It couldn't have been much bigger than that. It was a, it was a little guy. Um, the motor was an early Lawn Boy two-stroke, and I, and I read a little bit about these years later, and it turns out that was actually a, um, an outboard motor engine that was modified at the factory to work in a... Um, so Lawn Boy started out making two-stroke mowers using um, basically outboard motor engines. The flywheel was on top, and it was open. It was an open fly, open top. There was no shroud or anything. The, the fuel tank was a little round cylinder, um, that was mounted on its side at the front of the motor. Um, and what you would do is you grab the pull rope, which we had the original one with a wooden handle, and you wrap it around the starter cup and you pull it, and um, and it would, you know, hopefully run. I could not get it to run. I was not getting any spark. So we were getting fuel, we were getting compression, no spark. So I'm like, all right, well, what the hell? So I took the mag, I took the flywheel off. And I found the magneto had been completely destroyed. Um, it was cracked. It was junk. So I'm like, well, Dad, I don't know if we're ever going to get parts for this thing. So um, the Internet didn't really. The Internet wasn't really. a. We didn't have it. All right. It was a thing, but we weren't privy to that thing. 
and you you couldn't call you know any parts place. No one's gonna have parts for this. So I said, "Fuck it." I um, I took the motor off and I scrapped it. <laughs> I saved the deck. I was gonna put a Briggs motor on it. My dad was pissed. He was so pissed. And I'm like, what's the problem? We're never going to be able to fix it. We'll never find parts for this thing. And that was, you know, years later, I discovered the Internet and all the wonderful joys that it provided. Like, you can get you can get parts for, you name it. You think of something in your head, and you can get parts for it, no matter what it is, no matter how old it is. So I essentially scrapped my dad's mower. That mower is worth a Fucking fortune, an absolute fortune. Um, I, I, I just, and, and you try to find one now. Yeah, you're gonna pay through the nose to get one because they're they're the coolest looking mower you will ever see, aside from a um, an old uh, an old uh, real style mower. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that was. One of the dumbest things I ever did as a kid. You know, some teenagers, they get in a pot, they start drinking, you know, they burglarize the old lady next door. No, no. I destroyed my dad's lawnmower. That was my... That was my teen rebellion. I leave a very, lead a very vanilla life. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I wish I had stories of, you know, me stealing cars and robbing banks. No, I threw away my dad's antique lawnmower because I didn't think we'd ever get parts to fix it. Urgh. We actually kept the deck around for a number of years after that. And I think my dad actually finally scrapped the deck because he couldn't find a motor for it because I threw away the one he had. <sighs> oh, my God. So this is the lawnmower that my father bought in 2011 or so, and he stopped using it when he started using his uh, his tractor. He bought a pretty nice tractor, twin cylinder, Kohler powered Cub Cadet with the, every attachment they offer. It's nice, really nice machine. And he said, you know, I tell you what, um, why don't you just uh, buy this from me? So. Um, at the time, I was looking at new mowers, and I really, I did, I was really pinching pennies because I knew that in order to live in this house um, to make it through the first year, I had to replace the entire roof. I had to reglaze or replace every window in the house. I needed a completely new heating system. I needed an oil tank. Um, I needed to do some outside maintenance. I had to paint every freaking wall, replace every appliance. Oh my God, the list is growing. But I was pinching pennies and spending $500 on a lawnmower was not really something I was anxious to do. I had already bought an $800, $900 snowblower that I really needed. And um, I'm like, you know what? 150 bucks, I'll take it, done. So I bought this for my dad for 150 bucks or so. And um, it's been a good mower, I mean, really. I mean, I was never crazy about this mower. I mean, I, I really wish it wasn't this one that I had to buy from him, but because it, it is very chintzy in its in its in its construction. This is an MTD. Um, MTD builds basically everything now. Um, the the noise you hear is the air damper in my my flu. The wind is howling outside. Anyway, so this uh, this mower um, is very cheaply built. Um, it runs, it does the job. You know, one of the things I don't like about MTD is that, you know, they're, they they built their products not necessarily out of passion. It's almost like their products are designed entirely by bean counters. Um, it has to have self-propulsion, check. It must have a rear bag, check. It must have, you know, um, safety features that are required by law, check and check. Um, but none of the features work particularly well. I mean, it's it's like the Hyundai Excel of lawnmowers. I mean, the fully loaded Hyundai Excel of lawnmowers. It may have air conditioning. It might have, you know, sport trim or whatever, but none of those things really work that well. I mean, it, the self-propulsion is, is kind of, I mean, it works, you know, but it's just... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It, I can't quite put my but but look at how much flex this thing has. 
you know, the, the bag works great when it's attached, but it's always falling off because they didn't design the, um, the, uh, the retention mechanism very well. Um, you know, the cables that they used for the drive and for the uh, bailing arm, the, the dead man brake, they're kind of gritty. They're, they're very gritty, and they were gritty when he bought the machine. And he's taken the cables out. He's lubricated them properly. Remember, he, he was an auto mechanic for a number of years. He knows how to do, his, do this shit. Which is that everything just kind of seems a little chintzy. When you push the handle down... So here's the thing. The way they designed this deck, from this point back, everything is plastic. Everything is plastic. The wheels and axles, the gearbox... The bag and the handle are all supported by a chunk of plastic that is bolted to a steel body. Kind of chintzy. Saves them a lot of money at the uh, at the factory, though. Um, but you know, it's kind of chintzy. The deck has held up fairly well. It is rusting pretty badly underneath now. Um, you know, because they don't they don't use the high quality steels in these mower decks that they used to use, so they rust fairly quickly. I'm a little alarmed at the depth and the pitting that's going on under this machine. This is a mower that has been washed, cleaned out on a regular basis. There is no paint left underneath, none. There's no more paint. It's just bare steel and it's rusting. Um, you can see some of that is spreading to the outside. There's a lot of rust on the edge of the chute. So, you know, you're looking at very, very low end steel, cheap paint. You know, just get it out the door, slap a price of, I think he paid 350 for this thing, something like that. That's it. You know, the engine, though, the engine is kind of a bright spot on this machine. This is a, um, and I can't believe I'm saying this, I grew up fixing Tecumseh's, Briggs, and I think I fixed a Clinton once. But <laughs> this Chinese-built engine um, is actually probably the best part of the machine. It, um... It is dead nuts reliable. We've never had a problem with it. it it's what it's pushing 10 years old. Never a problem. Never. It it just starts usually on the first pull. Um, you know, it doesn't burn a ton of gas. I mean, I can do the whole lawn on about a tank or, or so. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a good engine. I mean, look at the block. I mean, it's it's not corroding or anything. It doesn't doesn't even look... It does leak oil, though. Um, it does have a bit of an oil leak up on up in the, uh, I think it's the upper crankshaft seal might be leaking a little bit. But beyond that, never a problem. And we haven't really done more than one or two oil changes. I think, I, I think my dad did the oil every year, and I know I did it when I when I got it. So um, it's, but I mean, mo I, I've, I've gone the whole season on this oil, and it still looks pretty clean in there. So... You know, I mean, it's uh, it's a good engine, but the deck is kind of weak. I mean, it's got some. If you want to fold the handle up, for example, you know, they didn't design a nice clutching mechanism that releases and you can fold the handle forward or anything. No, no, it's it's. You take these off, un you know, unscrew these. Uh, what do they call these things? It's not a nut. It's a um hand wheel, whatever. You unbolt this, take the bolt out, and the handle folds, and then you got to put them back in so you don't lose them. Um, you know, it works. It, it, it does the job, you know, but it's not a great machine. I wouldn't buy it. I wouldn't buy it new, and uh, you know, that's pretty much all I have to say about it, but it served its purpose, and I'm going to sell it. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is do a complete uh, tune-up, new plug, new filter, do an oil change, you know, maybe sharpen the blade, and then put it up and put it up on Flea Bay or Craigslist or something, and uh, we will sell it. The one nice thing about it, though, that my my new mower that you're going to see doesn't have, and that is it has swiveling front casters. That's a nice feature. The biggest issue that I have with this mower, though, and this isn't a made-up problem; it's a very real one. I have a fairly rough lawn. It's it could it could stand to be graded again. Um, but there's some ruts and there's there's some hills and valleys and it's kind of it's not exactly golf course material and these wheels these back wheels you know they're not really meant for that kind of terrain um, that's why they make the high wheeler mowers the high wheeler mowers are better for lawns like mine and um, 
I'm going to level with you. I was not in the market for a lawnmower. In fact, I was thinking about keeping this another couple years because it does run so well. And everything seems to work as intended. So um, I was not in the market for a mower. I actually went to Home Depot to get some paint. I needed a can of spray paint. And, well, I came home with a new mower. Let's take a look at it. So what we have here is my new mower. This is a Toro Recycler 22 Smart Stove. Um, I would never buy this machine um, had it not been for the price. Uh, <laughs> I don't, the reason I wouldn't have bought this mower is because honestly, I wanted my next mower to have an aluminum deck. I was gonna go, and I had been planning on buying a new one. I, I'd been saving up for a new one um, because I know eventually that one's gonna go and I will need to replace it. And after I bought my Toro snowblower, I decided at that point on that all new equipment that I buy will be Toro because that snowblower, let's just say, has held up very well. I've gone through two, win well, one and a half winters so far with that sucker. And I am impressed by its performance. I'm impressed by its quality. Just the other day, um, I was snow blowing the, the, the driveway, and what I didn't know is that the plow had come through and tore up part of the street. And in doing so, it placed some nice baseball-sized chunks of asphalt at the foot of my driveway. And I didn't see them. And I'm chugging along, and then I hear a cut chunk, and then I see what oh, looks like a fucking asteroid flying out of my snowblower. Well, that happened. <laughs> so immediately I, I, I stop the machine, I take a look inside, and no damage. I mean, there is some paint damage on the, in, on the uh, but that's going to happen anyway. You know, it just, that's how it happened to mine. You know, you're, the, snowblowers get paint damage on the inside the, um, uh, the chute area and the auger housing. Um, it, it just happens. And, or the blower housing, sorry. So, at the end of the season, I'm going to pull her apart. I'm going to pull the, uh, the entire auger assembly and the, and the blower, and I'm going to clean up the area really good. I'm going to find some good quality uh, farm equipment grade paint, and I'm going to paint the chips. Wherever the, wherever the paint was, was, was ruined, I'm going to repaint it so that it doesn't rust out on me. But the plastic upper housing of the blower, the, the, the blower housing, the upper half of it is all plastic. And it, it did get scratched, but it did not crack. It didn't shatter, didn't crack. And I'll get another 10 years out of it or so. Anyway, point being, I'm fairly happy with Toro's quality and their engineering. And I knew that my next mower, I was going to go with a Toro. So anyway, my plan was in the future, when that thing kicks up, I'm going to buy a Toro aluminum decked, the recycle. This is what they call a super recycler, and that was going to be my replacement. But I was over at Home Depot. Now it's winter; it's February, and they're just now starting to clear out whatever equipment they have from last year. Whatever's left has to be sold off, and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I got this $420 Toro for just $240. That's it. That's all I paid. That is what these things sell for used. Now, again, this isn't the model that I was going to buy, but it's every bit as good. And for that kind of money, I don't think I could do better. So let's talk about the Toro Recycler 22 Smart Stow and what I know about it. So this was a brand new machine. It was a display model at one point. Um, although it looks suspiciously like they just took it out of the box because, I mean, really, it looks it's just not dusty. It's not dirty or grungy like you'd expect. Um, so this one, I uh, the first thing I did, I'm, I, I'm, I was suspect of the low price. I'm like, this has got to be a customer return. So I took the fuel cap off and um, I smelled the tank. That's the first. I and mean, you're buying a lawnmower that's supposed to be brand new, but it's been. It looks like it may have been used. Smell the fuel tank, um, and it should smell clean. 
like plastic. And this one did. If you smell any hint of fuel, the very next thing you need to do, if you're at a store like Walmart or Home Depot, and you're looking at buying a machine that might be, it looks like it may have been a return, the next thing you do is check the oil. And if there's no oil on the dipstick, and you smell fuel, well, here's what happened. Somebody bought it, started it up, may have seized it, and then they may have done something to try to free it up so they could return it. And then the store says, oh, we can resell this. Yeah, that can happen. Just forewarning. No fuel, no oil. So this is a brand new machine. Um, and I looked inside the bag and it had all the paperwork. It had the oil bottle that comes with it from the factory. All, all there. So I said, you know what? And I thought about it. I walked around the store. I'm like, should I buy it? Should I buy it? Should I buy it? Should I buy it? I'm like, you know what? You only live once. Buy that more. <laughs> anyway, so I bought it. $240. If I wanted to, I could sell this for a profit in the springtime. I could put this up. If I just leave it the way it is, I've, I've already put the oil in. I've already started it. I know it runs, and you're going to see that in a little bit. I'm going to add that video footage in. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah. So... My thought is I could sell this thing for, I could probably get $350 out of it. $350, that's a healthy profit. That is a $100, $110 profit. If I could get that, I might just do it. Um, but I'm thinking more and more about just hanging on to it and using it for next year. Um, and then selling that guy. I could probably get about $150 out of that thing if I clean it up and give it a tune-up. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident I could do that. But... Um, so what about it? Um, so it's a uh, it's a pretty well equipped machine for Toro. Um, they have an all, they have an, a complete lineup of lawnmowers ranging from they have a very cheaply made um, built similar to that Cub Cadet right there with a plastic um, not only in the rear but plastic in the front with a steel round steel deck in the middle. So the wheels and handle are all supported by plastic. It's a 21 inch model. That's their cheapest one, and it's 280 bucks. It's got a Briggs motor on it, smaller one than this, I believe. Um, but that's their basic mower. And then you go from that to the Recycler 22 inch deck, uh, which comes in a variety of configurations. Um, the base model of this mower has this engine. It's a Briggs 7.25. Uh, foot pound of torque, uh, 163 cc uh, motor um, with the same basic blade and recycler mechanism. But I don't believe, I think it's a rear bagger, but no self propel option. It has two standard sized or four standard sized wheels, and it does not have the mow and stow um, option as well. So it's a fairly basic mower, and that one even sells for about 300 some bucks a little over 300 dollars and uh, then you've got you know they run the gamut of options some of them have electric start as an option some of them have mow and stow depending on depending on what price point you're looking at uh, but this one is uh this is a fairly well equipped model this has this is a high wheeler in the back mow and stow so the mow and stow machines you can store them vertically like this they're designed to be stored like this um, and they have a bag that you can get that, that covers them up for dust and whatnot. Uh, the Mo and Still models have a specially designed Briggs and Stratton engine that is designed to be stored in a vertical position. There are some um, changes to the I think the oil cap is sealed up a little bit differently, and, um, and they've got a few different things that are different about them. I don't know what exactly, other than the badging. Um, so let's put it, let's, let's get it upright or, vert, or correctly. Before you do, let's take a look underneath. Um, so we've got, you know, a steel deck, steel in the front, um, and the back is plastic. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, how is that any different from any other cheap lawnmower? Um, I don't really know why they did this in plastic, but it's... Um, if it's anything like the plastic that they used on the snowblowers, um, this is a very high impact plastic. It should not break under normal use. If you hit a rock or something, it may scratch it. It, may, it, may, it will scratch it, but it may crack it. Now, the good thing is it is replaceable. It's not like you can't replace this part if it breaks. It's probably gonna cost a bloody fortune, but it is replaceable. 
Um, Underneath is where you'll find the uh, the blade. Now, what's nice about the Moen stone machines is that in the vertical position, it makes it so much easier to change out the blade or to replace the drive belt. It just makes it that much easier because everything is accessible. You don't have to worry about awkwardly placing the mower on its side. And the cats love these bags. I should just get them one of these bags. They would love it. You love it, don't you? Anyway, so let's take a look at the construction. So the wheels are supported by these fairly thick steel plates um, that are mounted to a swivel mechanism, which is then mounted to the to the deck with an adjuster and all that. Um, you've got a side discharge chute that can you can, it actually comes with a side discharge chute. If you decide not to use the rear bag, you can use the side discharge chute. Nice option, don't think I'll ever use it, but I've got it. Now the rear, um, the self-driving mechanism is pretty simple, or self-drive, the, <laughs> the propulsion mechanism is uh, fairly basic. It's a single speed gearbox uh, driven off the crankshaft with, through a belt here. And how it works is when you apply pressure to this handle here, what it does is it pushes, it swivels the gearbox backwards to add tension to the belt. And it's designed so that instead of having like what the MTD has, the uh, Cub Cadet, instead of having a, um, a drive plate with a rubber drive, drive wheel that uh, changes speed by varying the, the distance from the center of the drive plate, um, the drive wheel, it goes like this, in and out. Um, how did I, I should put that more elegant, elegantly. By varying the distance from the center, um, you know what I'm saying? You, you know what a drive wheel looks like or a drive plate mechanism, a friction drive? Yeah, instead of doing all that, what Toro did is they're using, it's very simple, it's using the amount of tension on the belt, which allows for a certain amount of slippage. Um, to regulate the speed. So the more pressure you put against that handle, the more tension is applied to the belt. So it's designed to slip under normal conditions. I'm not really sure how that translates to belt wear, but I'm sure it does contribute to a significant amount of belt wear. But it's very simple, and the belt looks to be very easy to change in this thing. The gearbox is made entirely of plastic, um, so it is probably going to be a wearable item. I know that on these, I did some homework on this, and the rear drive gears are a wear item. So as the machine gets older, it'll start to slip, and all you do is put on a new set of wheels. I mean, wheels themselves on lawnmowers are a wearable item anyway, so... I'm not too concerned about it. Apparently they use steel drive gears on the shaft and they mesh with a plastic ring gear that is part of the rear wheel. So when the rear wheels wear out, you replace them. I mean, it's a wearable item, just like the blade, just like the belt. Under normal use, the gearbox should probably lasts a good long time. Um, they're all plastic now, so I mean, that's just the world we live in. It does have a, a deck washing port. I'm not sure I'm ever going to use that um, because I don't really believe they work. <laughs> but, you know. So let's take a look at the top side. And to flip it, you just grab it. So this handle, is, it's got a little plastic um, grip on it to make it a little more comfortable for you. Just drop it down. And then you start to see some of Toro's engineering. So. Uh, the, what you got here are these, these are plastic, there's a lot of plastic on this machine, I'm going to forewarn you, a lot of plastic use, um, but it seems to be used in an intelligent way. So the parts that are plastic, that are probably going to break sometime in the future, they appear to be very easy to replace, and I would imagine that your Toro dealer is going to have them in stock. The, now the use of plastic, it does two things. It gives them complete freedom over the, the design of the part. So it's easier to design and shape parts out of plastic than it is any other material. It's also cheaper. But these plastic parts are very smooth acting. Very smooth, very easy to use. Um, so, I mean, there is that. 
You know what I mean? There's no chunkiness, there's no squeaking, it just glides open. Like, it's a very well-designed part. Now, the plastic that Toro uses appears to be pretty high quality. Um, as plastics go, you know, you're not dealing with the world's cheapest ABS plastic here. This is going to be fiber reinforced, probably tool grade plastic. Um, the same stuff that they make, you know, your your DeWalt screw guns out of. It actually appears to be much dur more durable than that. I mean, let's put it this way. I, that DeWalt screw gun right there, I have dropped that thing from the rafters in my garage. It slammed into the concrete slab with vigor and it didn't break. So I think we can get over the fact that they're using plastic on these machines and just deal with it. If things break, you replace them. The handle is made out of a very, it looks like a very high fiber reinforced content. Um, that's, I mean, just looking at it is, it, it's got to be, it's got to be some kind of miracle plastic. Um, it's a little squeaky. I'm going to have to put some lubricant. Uh, this stuff works. I would normally use uh, fluid film because that stuff is awesome. But we'll just take, see if we can get rid of this. Get rid of that. So we're going to spray a little bit. See how that does. Ah, look at that. No more squeaks, and it works a little smoother. <laughs> nice. The cable action on this bailing arm, oh, so smooth. Compared to that freaking Cub Cadet, oh, man. Now, that Cub Cadet was rough the day it was born. This is so smooth. And you press on that. What it does is, as we, as we demonstrated underneath, you press on this, and this... Uh, this counter lever arm thing it takes your downward motion, turns it into upward motion, pulls on this cable. This is how you adjust your drive engagement. If it engages too early or too roughly, roughly is roughly, yeah, I guess too roughly kind of works. <laughs> if, if, it's, if it's all cattywampus, you just loosen this up and change the position of the cable. It couldn't be simpler. Look at that. Look at that. Nice. Anyway. What were we talking about? Lawnmowers. So, the one thing I'm concerned about with this machine isn't the plastic. It's not. It's none of that. Um, I am a little concerned about the engine. All right. Now, as I talked about earlier, I am. Uh, I've been fixing lawnmower engines mostly when I was younger. As I got older, I didn't really have to do it so much. But I always loved the old Briggs engines. Um, the old L head Briggs motors were the best. They were indestructible. They were easy to fix and you could count on them. Times have changed. Times have changed. So when the Chinese started exporting their engines to the US, um, it started out with a trickle and then all of a sudden everybody's using them, including Toro, <laughs> including Generac. Generac's using them now. Damn. So when that started really, really unfolding, um, the, the poor guys at Briggs and Tecumseh, the two biggest American small engine producers, hell, even Honda, started shaking in their boots. They're like, what do we do? We, you know, it, became, it started to become a battle on price, nothing else. It seems like with consumers, price is the one driving force between... You know, consumers have become bean counters. Well, honey, this machine has an American-made Briggs & Stratton engine, but it's 15 cents more than this one, which has a Chinese, which has, well, they, they're not going to say, it doesn't say on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the bill of goods, new Chinese engine. No, no, it says Toro's own engine. Or it'll say Generac's very own engine. Or Cub Cadet's very own. And so they're thinking, oh, so Cub Cadet, or Toro, or whatever, they must be making their own engines now, and it's only 15 cents cheaper. Let's buy that. I'm exaggerating a little bit and putting a little bit of, a little bit of, um, what do they call that, creative whatever juice. So what I'm saying is consumers have really started to buy on price rather than on reputation. But 
then it was like a perfect storm because then the EPA steps in and they start increasing the uh, requirements for small engine producers or uh, reducing the amount of allowed pollutants that they are allowed to produce. Small, excuse me, small engines, lawnmower engines, snowblower engines, they are one of the biggest polluters that we have. They really are, it's the truth. Um, they do not have any feedback fuel control, fuel, um, fuel system control. So you can have a machine that runs rich for its whole life and you'd never know it. Uh, there is no catalytic converter. You know, the engines are not designed for efficiency. They're not designed for um, not just efficiency, but they're not designed for pollution control. Uh, the fuel systems over the, over, the, over the past many years, um, they were designed to ventilate straight into the atmosphere. So small engines pollute more than a car. Yes, it's true. So the EPA is finally coming down on these companies and saying, look, knock it off. So the Chinese have a bit of an advantage there because number one, the R&D that went into building their own engine, like that engine right there, the R&D that went into designing that engine is basically nil. They just took a Honda motor and reverse engineered it and boom, instant engine. So they don't really have any costs sunk into the design of their motors so that they could then use some of that, uh, that advantage, if you will, to design more fuel efficient carburetors, um, to fine tune the fuel system so that they don't ventilate into the atmosphere and, and they can do it while still maintaining a profit and charging an absolute minimum for their products. The American engine manufacturers, on the other hand, they designed their motors and have been continually improving them over the past you know, 50 years. Um, their costs are higher both in manufacturing and materials and manpower, and woman power, people power. So they're at a bit of a disadvantage and they're trying to still make a profit and pay their employees an American salary. So what do they do? They take their existing engine designs and they start to cheapen them out while adding anti-pollution controls to them. If you look at that block right there, that block looks strikingly similar to the old Briggs motors of the past. It's same basic shape, just thinner. The castings are thinner, uh, much thinner. Uh, the engine weighs less because they've been able to shave material from a lot of places. And they've shaved off so much material that they've had to add ribbing to the block. Look at that. <laughs> Come on, man. The um, materials that went into this engine are not nearly as high-end as they once were. For example, the starter cup. We'll go back to our old discussion on the, um, on the little two-stroke uh, iron horse motor that I threw away for the, uh, uh, for, the, for the the lawn boy. Now that had a starter cup that was a heavy steel cup and you would literally wrap a rope around it and then pull the rope. Obviously a recoil starter still has the starter cup. It's just designed so that when you pull the rope, okay, the teeth engage, if I can demonstrate this, the teeth are designed to engage on the inside of the cup. So these little teeth poke out from the, uh, the recoil mechanism and they lock into the inside of this cup like this. And they rotate the crankshaft like that. So when you pull the rope, that's, that's your starter cup. Throughout history, they've been made out of steel. Usually a, 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 uh, a drawn steel cup they never break. They never fail. It's the one thing on an engine you never have to replace. Just the recoil starter itself when they wear out sometimes. So Briggs and Stratton realized that if they change the material on their consumer grade machines, the, this, in this case we have an EXI engine, it changed it to fiber reinforced plastic. Under normal use, that would be okay. But the problem with these, so the problem with consumer grade equipment is that they're used by consumers. And consumers, they don't like mowing their lawns, they don't like running their snowblowers, they just wanna go watch TV. 
This is, this is how we are. So when we go to start the engine, we pull that cord as if we pull that cord so hard to get that engine started, even though it's brand new. Yeah, that happens. And they pull it and they, they rip it out of, the, out of the engine. And the stress of doing that causes excessive wear and undue stress on that little piece of plastic that eventually, could be one, could be two, could be five years down the road, the cup completely shatters. <coughs> that is what happens to these engines. Now the cup is replaceable. But Briggs and Stratton made it out of a cheaper material so that they could sell more parts, sell more service, sell more engines. Because a five-year-old engine, the average Joe isn't going to be like, oh, well, let's go get it fixed. They're going to say, oh, honey, let's go get a new mower. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that, 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 that's one thing. The other thing is the carburetors, they're made out of a fiber-reinforced plastic as well. And now... It, that's not a bad thing. Um, I mean, they've been using plastic carburetors for years, but the original ones were made out of, I believe, um, I believe they were made out of nylon or some other material. And they were designed in such a way that there was a lot of give, a lot of forgiveness in the design of the carburetor so that it wouldn't, like, it wouldn't go completely out of spec, you know, quickly. It, it would take some time, you know, for that plastic to start to... Um, you know, to, to, to change with the exposure to heat and fuel. But from what I've been hearing, these new carburetors, they're actually using a float carburetor on these. The suction carburetor days are the vacuum jets. That's long gone. They don't do that anymore. But you see the bottom of that bowl is all plastic. The whole carburetor body is plastic. And the bowl is attached. How is it attached? Let's see. Probably a bolt that goes through here somewhere. No, it's screwed in. It's actually screwed in on two two points. Okay, that's all right. So it can be removed for service, but you know, over time, it's going to go out of spec. It's going to it will leak. Uh, it will leak eventually, and it'll just run like crap. And then you replace the whole carburetor. You know? uh, but these engines are not as robust as they once were. Toro uses Briggs engines on a lot of their machines. I'm a little surprised because they also have their own in-house sourced engines which are a Chinese motor. I believe they're from Lonson. And they have a very tight relationship with Lonson. Uh, in fact, my snowblower has a Lonson motor on it. It is a great engine. I have no complaints about it. Other than it's not made in the US. But neither is this Briggs. This Briggs is made in Mexico along with the whole mower. So. Yeah, you know, so much for wanting an American engine. If you were buying this machine because of the Briggs engine, you're thinking you're buying an American motor, you're wrong. However, you are buying a product that was designed by an American company, and the revenue from that engine's sales, the engine's sale, will go to the American company. And Toro is an American company as well, so you're supporting an American manufacturer, in theory, <laughs> um, but, you know... So I've been yammering on and on about this machine and what I don't like about it. But what I do like about it is, again, the design, is, it's very versatile. Um, it stores nicely. Um, I like how the bag is attached. It won't fall off like the Cub Cadet does. Um, it is a high wheeler. So I should be able to mow this lawn much easier. It'll be smoother. The other thing I like about it is it can be adjusted on the fly. I don't have to pull the wheels off to change the height. And yes, that became an issue with the Cub Cadet because there was one point where I decided to mow the lawn a little bit taller. As the grass started to fill in, I'm like, I should, I should just see if I can get it a little taller. So I had to raise the deck on that a little bit. Now the rear wheels on the Cub Cadet can be adjusted by just one lever, but the front wheels, I gotta pull the axles off. So it's kind of a pain, kind of a pain in the ass. So, what else can I tell you, other than let's hear it run? But before we do, let's take a look, let's talk about one more thing. <laughs> There's always one more thing. So Briggs and Stratton, so not only did they cheapen out their engines, 
they, they, they had this, this is a brilliant idea. And it's all in marketing. It's all in marketing. They designed their engines so that you never need to change the oil. Air quotes here. You never need to change the oil. It's lifetime oil. Just check and add. Make sure there's oil in it. That is brilliant marketing because it suckers consumers into thinking that this engine is somehow superior and it never needs an oil change. Now the argument that they, this is what they say. Briggs and Stratton's claim is that because the engine is built with such, with better or tighter tolerances, um, it's built with lower friction in mind. Uh, so they coated the cylinder or the piston, they coated the piston and maybe even the bore. Um, it has a better air, air filter. It has a pleated air filter. Here it is. I'll show you how easy it is to replace. Pop this little cover off, and there's your air filter, just like that. It's actually quite nice. Um, but better air filtration. Um, it has a uh, you know a sealed fuel system or some shit. Um, it, and it runs cooler because this is an overhead valve engine, unlike their old L head motors, which I love. But unlike the old L head motors, this has an overhead valve design. It's designed to run cooler, which extends the oil life substantially. And that may be true. That may be very true. But their claim that you never need to change the oil, meaning you are never removing the break-in deposits, you're never removing any, you're just, you're never, you just keep adding to it. I think it's a load of bunk. Um, but there's some, there's, there's, there, now there's some truth into that because if the oil has never been, you can, you can run a mower all, you can run it for five years without changing the oil. It's not going to blow. It's not going to die in five years. If you don't, in under, under, under a normal, you know, tract house lawn, you will never need to change the oil if you decide to keep the mower for no more than about five seasons. You could probably go 10 seasons. But, but, changing the oil on a lawnmower costs three bucks, and it extends the life of the engine well past what the manufacturer claims it'll last in a case of a uh, check and add <laughs> type of engine. I could probably just run this thing for 10 years and never change the oil. I mean, as long as I'm using a high end synthetic oil and I'm just making sure it never runs dry. I mean, it's not gonna blow up. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's one of those, it, it makes you think about stuff. That kind of a statement, it makes you sit and think, okay, how many engines do you think, small engines like this, blow up due to lack of oil changes? As long as there's oil in the motor, it actually, in theory, would be okay. And, and it brings me back to that old lady that I used to mow her lawn for. I mowed her lawn for a number of years, and she had a mower in her, in her um, shed. It was a 1960s Montgomery Ward, it was a Garden Power or some brand. It was a, it was a store brand. And I, I talked to her husband about it. He had used that mower from 1962 to about 1993. And he never changed the oil. He only just added oil to it. He never once changed the oil. And this is an old Briggs L-head or flathead motor. Um, never did an oil change. I was the first one to change the oil on that engine because I, because I, I, after I found out they had their own mower, I'm like, well, why don't I just get it running for you so that you can use it if you, if, you know, because I was moving out of the neighborhood. So she decided that she was going to start mowing her own lawn. And... Um, so I got the mower running, and I changed the oil, and it was full of diamonds and coal. <laughs> it was just, like, nasty. But it still ran. It didn't knock. didn't smoke. So, you, you know, it's... it's hmm. The sensibility and the, the, the mechanic in me says never changing the oil is bad, and it's going to lead to a dead machine. One thing that it will do is it will increase the rate of oil consumption and it will cause wear to the special magic coatings that are on the piston. That will happen. Short story long, I'm going to be changing the oil once a season because Briggs and Stratton does say, not that it matters what they say, but they say that it won't hurt to change the oil. Not a bad idea. Go ahead, knock yourself out. 
but you won't void the warranty, the one-year warranty, by not doing it. <laughs> of course not. The warranty's for one year. Well, I think Toro guarantees it to start for three years, but whatever. Uh, so, anyway. To change the oil in one of these engines, you, you there's two ways to do it. You can take the oil cap off and tilt it on its side and let the oil flow out the side of the, 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 filler, the filler neck. That's kind of messy, and you're going to scratch up your wheels. I'm going to get an oil. Um, they have, you can get a suction device. Actually, Harbor Freight sells them. And Briggs & Stratton sells one, too. Uh, yes, they will sell you a kit to change the oil in an engine that they say never needs an oil change. But they'll sell you a kit to do it. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, um, you can just suck the oil out of the, out of the fill tube and replace it with a nice quality synthetic SAE30. Briggs recommends SAE30 in this motor, um, which is an oil standard that they've been using for centuries under normal use. This is not a commercial machine at all. Don't use it as one. <laughs> um, if this motor, if this mower blows up, the next thing I'm gonna buy is a Toro recycler, super recycler with the aluminum deck or I'll just put a motor on it. We'll see what happens. These motors aren't very expensive. It's like a hundred dollar mower, motor. <laughs> yeah, you can buy these motors for like a hundred bucks or 150, 200 bucks or so. They're not, they're not, a, they're not an expensive engine, but. So, there we go. We talked about a lawnmower for like an hour now. A couple lawnmowers. Do I have any more anecdotes to throw into this? For those of you who care. Um, yeah, so we're gonna sell that guy, not not Oreo. We're gonna sell the mower. I'm gonna try to get 150 for it. I'm gonna fix it up, clean it up, you know, give it an oil change, give it a spark plug, and just do a whole tune up on it. And um, then I'm gonna put it on the put it on flea bay or something. I may not sharpen the blade. I don't want to get involved in that on a mower on a mower that I'm not even keeping. No thanks. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's been a good machine. I, I, you know, I just I'm not crazy about MTD products. I, you know, I bought an MTD um, uh, lawn vacuum, and you know, it's got to be the most miserable device I've ever owned. Just the the overall cheapness of its design is just incredible. And this thing wasn't cheap. This was like 500 bucks, and um, I am very disappointed in the build quality, but. It does the job, and it does it all right. It does it does a pretty good job of sucking up leaves, but nothing else. Wow, this thing has a smaller engine than the uh, than the lawnmower. No shit. It's a 159. That's a 163. You think this would have a bigger motor? I mean, it's physically larger. Let's compare the two side by side. Let's take a look. I mean, this is definitely a beefier engine when you look at it uh, from above. Just the machine is physically larger. But yeah, it's the same engine that's on the lawnmower. Same basic, basic motor. No, it's not. The block is way different. Eh, a little different. Yeah, it's not the same block for sure. But yeah, it's a physically beefier motor though. Um, it, it just looks like it though. Or is it just an illusion? Yeah, I don't know. I'll tell you, the first oil change I did on this thing, the stuff came up black. Because it still had a, and it wasn't black, it was silver. Um, there was a lot of assembly lube in there. Um, it was nasty. Absolutely disgusting. What kind of carburetor is that? It's a hua hua ye hua ye hua ye. That's gonna make. Uh, if you look at that carburetor, if you watch my video on the Honda generator, um, it, the carburetor looks just like the Honda carburetor. But yeah, this thing here only used it for one season. Very happy with it. I had to get the hose replaced. Uh, not the hose. The um, the nozzle on the on the top here. I had to get. I had to actually send out for this, and they sent it to me for free because um, the original one broke after one use. I won't be using that hose anymore. <laughs> not 
Not even, yeah, not gonna happen. What is this? Oh, that's the bearing for the, uh, for the old, for the old drill press. Anyway, so that, that's that. This is getting sold off. And this thing, I'm gonna hopefully get, I'm gonna try to get 10 years out of it. We'll see what happens. I mean, I will replace parts. I will replace, and I will do tune-ups on it, whatever I've gotta do. I don't wanna buy another mower for 10 years. I think it'll last. As long as I, as long as I do what I normally do, and that's take care of it. Keep it clean, keep it maintained. As long as I do that. I think I'll be alright. And then that just folds up like that. Now I'm not gonna store it vertically. No thanks. I don't think that's a good idea, even though it's designed for it. Let's get this thing out of here. I only put a little bit of fuel on there, so. Before my battery dies, let's see how the uh, big Cub Cadet has aged underneath. Let's let's see how this thing looks. Yeah, look at that. Looks like it spent some time underwater. That is all scaly rust. Yep. Uh, it's so nasty. The bolts are rusting. Not rotting, but they're rusting. This is all plastic here. It's held up okay. It's just very flexible, but the whole rear end of the machine is supported by just plastic. I mean, that in and of itself isn't really a bad thing. It's just, it just shows, you know, the overall cheapness of the design. That's all, that's all it does. You know, it's really just a personal, you know, I just, I'm just not crazy about that. The whole rear of the machine is supported by plastic, so. I'm just afraid that one of these days I'm gonna pick it up by the handle. The handle's gonna break off. I mean, look, it just it just feels like it's gonna break. Look at that, it's so nasty, so chintzy. But and, you know, it works, it works. It does the job. I should stop ragging on it so much because now I gotta sell it and get some money out of it. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you for watching. I hope this video wasn't too terrifyingly boring. And uh, we'll get to see some kitties in the process. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. What's this thing? I'm afraid of it. <laughs>